Hey, I'm Henry, and I made a mistake. <sighs> Whoops. See, in December, I made a video where I ranked every Spider-Man movie. Now, that was before No Way Home had come out, and I was in a big Spider-Man mood. I was real excited. But I did make a mistake. You see, that ranking was based purely off of memory. How dumb am I, you know? Very is the answer, actually. I actually only rewatched the MCU movies, mainly not even for that video, just to get ready for No Way Home. So you can see that maybe that video wasn't accurate. Initially, I had planned to rewatch every Spider Man movie to lead up to No Way Home, but just with the timing of everything and the cost, I didn't see a practical way that I could have done it. However, I set things up on my shelves now. I have since gotten every Spider-Man movie and rewatched them all. Uh, I know No Way Home isn't here, but there isn't a Blu-ray release of that yet. So we got the Tobey Maguire trilogy, the Andrew Garfield duology, the Tom Holland trilogy. I know there's only two here, but also No Way Home. And then the best one. And today I want to take a look back and not just re-rank them, which is something I'm going to do at the very end, so hold your horses, but also review every single Spider-Man movie properly, having now rewatched all of them. Now, I need to stipulate some things. For this review specifically, I only rewatched the Tobey Maguire trilogy and the Andrew Garfield duology. Spider-Verse is a movie I have seen so many times, probably more than any of those other movies. I have seen Spider-Verse a lot, so I didn't feel the need to rewatch it, because my thoughts are pretty sound on that movie. <laughs> and I didn't rewatch the Tom Holland MCU movies, No Way Home, because it's still just in theaters and my thoughts are pretty definitive on it, and I'm just waiting for a Blu-ray re-release so I can watch it again. And the other two because I had just watched them just before No Way Home came out and I had watched them enough times. I have a pretty good understanding on the MCU movies. It's really the Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield movies that I haven't seen in years until just now. So that's what I want to take a look at. So if you would kindly join me today as I dive deep into the world of Spider-Man movies going from 2002 all the way to 2021, and seeing how they've changed, which ones are good, which ones are bad, how I like them all, and then at the very end, I'm gonna re-rank them because I have a feeling my opinions might have changed just a smidgen. So let's get into it. I have absolutely no clue which movies I'm gonna talk about first, so I'm gonna just have randomly selected one in my hands. Who would have guessed? The Tobey Maguire Trilogy is oddly consistent. That's what I'm just gonna say. Straight up, these three movies are oddly consistent. I know people don't like the third one, but watch them all in a row. They are weirdly consistent in tone, in energy, in humor. It is strange because the third one isn't really that bad if you compare it to the first or the second one. And it's so weird to me that it is so consistently hated, but also loved because it is most certainly the funniest. But to explain what I mean, let's start with Spider-Man 1. Spider-Man 1 is clearly just an origin story. It's an origin movie for Spider-Man. And there are a few things I love and a few things I don't love about this movie. The movie has relatively good pacing and tonal consistency. However, that tone is, and I feel that you should all know this, really, really, really cheesy and corny. And I think that was entirely intentional, and personally, I love it. People like to act as if the Tobey Maguire movies, at least the first and the second one, are immaculate works of Spider-Man art that are so grounded and great and just incredible. And honestly, you guys need to rewatch the movies because they are cheesy and corny, and I love it for that reason. These movies are hilarious, and I think it was 100% intentional by Sam Raimi to make them 
exactly how they are. The movie has really good pacing. You see Spider-Man's origins, and you see Green Goblin's origins, and you see Spider-Man doing the wrestling, and then you see Green Goblin blowing up the competition, and you just see them inching towards becoming who they're meant to be until finally they meet head-to-head -head at the uh, World Fair, and this is the first confrontation and the first battle of the film. But there is also an issue I have with this. Whereas I think the movie is paced well and edited tightly with one thing happening, then another beat, then another beat, then another beat, I also think it almost takes too long for them to meet. Now clearly this movie is based entirely off of the Ultimate Comics. Oscorp makes the spiders, Peter's a little bit annoying to his uncle and aunt before uh, Uncle Ben gets shot. You know, there are things like that that are clearly more inspired by the Ultimate Comics. And I know in the Ultimate Comics that it takes a bunch of issues for Spider-Man to actually become Spider-Man. In the first volume of Ultimate Spider-Man Power and Responsibility, it isn't until the final issue that you actually see Spider-Man. And I know I had previously praised the Ultimate Comics for doing this. It gave us more time to get invested in and know the characters. And honestly, I really like that. But the thing is, Whereas Power and Responsibility worked, because it isn't until the last issue, so what would be probably the last 20 minutes of a movie, that we actually see Spider-Man. In this movie, we see Spider-Man and Green Goblin fight about halfway through the movie, meaning that the other hour of the movie is like jam-packed full of a bunch of fast-paced action between Spider-Man and Green Goblin, and them finding out each other's secret identities and trying to figure things out and battling. And it's weird because it is well paced and tightly edited, but at the same time, I couldn't help but thinking, why is this happening now? Of course, there is also one other very not good thing about this movie, and I think everyone agrees, Kirsten Dunst as Mary Jane Watson is one of the worst characters, and I think is consistently the worst character in all three of these movies. She sucks. She is just annoying. She has no regard for anyone else, it seems, and she just... Ugh. I know that she has a good character, sort of. This isn't the movie where she's by far the worst. She definitely becomes way worse in the second and third Spider-Man movies, but she isn't great here either. I feel in this movie she's more boring than anything else but I digress. Other than that, there's not much for me to say about this movie. I think everyone here watching this has seen this movie at least 10 times over. It is insanely popular and for very, very good reason. It is great. And just because it is corny and cheesy and has bad characters and odd pacing despite me still liking it, that doesn't make it a bad movie. I still think that the Spider-Man suit looks really good aside from the eyes. The eyes is actually the one thing on the Tobey Maguire suit that I don't like, but I think it works within the context of the suit. Overall, I think that it looks really good. The CGI can be a little hit or miss, definitely a little more miss, but it's not horrible, especially because it's just a Spider-Man movie, you know? It's still fun and it still has the main things that we're looking for, which is the web swinging. Of course, there is the best decision ever made in the history of anything ever, and that is Willem Dafoe as the Green Goblin, who is the best thing ever in the history of everything. He is amazing, I love Willem Dafoe, I love him so much. Willem Dafoe is great. Of course, there is also uh, J. Jonah Jameson, J.K. Simmons, who is the best character in all of these movies, without a doubt. There is not a single part of me that does not believe that J.K. Simmons, J. Jonah Jameson portrayal is the perfect J. Jonah Jameson. There is a reason why in the MCU they just didn't recast him, because they couldn't find anyone better. He's not in the Tazm series because they literally couldn't find anyone that could rival J.K. Simmons. That is how good he is. Overall, I think this movie's really good. It's by far not the best Spider-Man movie, but it isn't terrible. It's actually really good, and it's Honestly, a lot more funny than I thought. <laughs> I really ended up enjoying this movie. I'm gonna say, though, that in this all-fairness ranking, it's gonna be a 7.5 out of 10. And I want to explain this a little bit because American school systems have made ranking things odd. See, in American school systems, a 7 out of 10 is a C, which is considered average. 
And so I think that has made pretty much the general public's perception of a 7 out of 10 to mean, eh, not that great. Where in actuality, I'm using 5 out of 10 to represent a true baseline. So a 7 and a half out of 10, that's pretty good. That's what I'd consider a really good movie. I just want to get that out of the way with because I'm going to be using that same scale for pretty much ever because I like that scale a lot more. <laughs> 5 out of 10 should be the average rather than 7 out of 10. But of course, with Spider-Man 1 out of the way, we have to move into what is the most highly respected and highly loved movie of pretty much every Spider-Man movie. Not even just this trilogy. This movie is insanely loved, insanely, insanely praised, and it might be deserved. <laughs> I'm of course talking about Spider-Man 2. Where to begin? This movie is incredible. I don't know what it is, but I watched it and I finished it and I didn't even realize that the two hours had gone by because it is so well paced and well edited. Everything happens with a natural flow that just makes things seem better. It seems that whatever issues they got from the first Spider-Man movie, they saw them and they worked out the kinks and they got in what is the best edited Spider-Man movie, I think. The story that Spider-Man 2 tells of choosing whether to live your dreams or what is responsible and what is right is a really good story for Spider-Man, I feel, and it perfectly encapsulates every important aspect of his character into just one finite story. And I think that's really great that they were able to do that with this movie. Of course, Alfred Molina is great as sort of Doc Ock. I'm gonna say sort of because here is the thing. He's super not the comic book Dr. Octopus. Alfred Molina jokes around a lot. He makes a lot of things. He's only focused on building his fusion reactor, which I see a lot of people getting confused about why the tentacle arms want to do that. It's because their only programming is to keep the fusion reactor stable. So without a fusion reactor, they have no purpose. So the tentacle arms want a purpose, ergo build a fusion reactor, you know? But this is super different from the comics, obviously. I don't think anyone's trying to deny that. When he drops Aunt May and is like, oop, Butterfingers. That's just not something that would happen in the comics with Doc Ock, even in the 60s comics. But the thing is, I don't mind it. I think he's doing a great job at his own portrayal of Dr. Octopus, and I think it works really, really well for the movie that it's in. There are obviously some incredible action set pieces. I mean, the train fight is still loved today, and I gotta admit, while watching it, I was like, damn, this is really kinetic and high energy and fun, and I actually really love seeing this, and yeah, so this might be one of the best fight scenes in any Spider-Man movie. <laughs> And the whole end bit when he stops the train and the New Yorkers are like, you want to get to him, you gotta get through me, and me, and me. That was just really sweet. Of course, it doesn't really last because he's a, a very strong maniac with the tentacle arms, but, you know, still pretty cool. <laughs> it was really sweet, okay? Of course, this movie isn't perfect. It is incredible, but it isn't perfect. Kirsten Dunst is back. It's the biggest disappointment of the movie, I'm sorry. This movie in particular, she seems really terrible. I don't know what it is. She seems just awful. So in the previous movie, Peter Parker rejects Mary Jane Watson because he knows that he's Spider-Man and he can't have the responsibility of any of his villains finding out who he is and then going after uh, Mary Jane. So he rejects Mary Jane so that she doesn't get hurt, which is a really noble and responsible thing to do. You know, that's Spider-Man's whole thing. With great power comes great responsibility. But then in this movie, Mary Jane is angry at Peter Parker because Peter Parker won't say that he loves her, even though he clearly does, and you know, sure, fine. So to get back at Peter, she goes and falls in love with an astronaut, then promises to marry the astronaut just to get back at Peter, then while engaged to the astronaut, goes on a lunch date with Peter and tries to get him to kiss her and admit that he loves her, and then on the wedding day with the astronaut, she runs out of the chapel just to go to Peter and be like, I love you, I don't care if you're Spider-Man. What? What? On paper, 
on paper, the idea could have worked. If she just wasn't so terrible with it. She flip-flops back and forth with her, oh, I like him not. I like him, I like him not. I like him, I like him not. And it just is infuriating to watch because I just don't like it. It is legitimately the one part of this movie that I don't enjoy. It's Kirsten Dunst as MJ. But this movie's amazing. I, I, even I have to admit that this movie's amazing. The world is just hating on Peter Parker, and I like that it's a whole movie about him wanting to live for himself for just a little bit, but then understanding that people get hurt if he doesn't, and it's his responsibility to do what's right and save the people. I think the scene where he goes into a burning building and saves the child as Peter Parker, but then understands that people still get hurt because someone was trapped and died because he wasn't Spider-Man, I think that's a really powerful and important scene. Aunt May, she has a good line in this uh, movie where she's packing up and getting ready to move and she's talking about how everyone needs a hero and Spider-Man is the hero of the city and even though it might not be what he wants, it's what's responsible and what's right. And you gotta do that because that's what makes the hero in all of us. And it's a great movie, it's a great line. <laughs> Also want to touch briefly because they improved the Spider-Man suit in this movie somehow. In the first Spider-Man movie, it looked like the whole thing almost was just like rubber and that felt really weird. In this movie, you can actually see that it's fabric and it looks really good and they darkened the blue bits and they lightened the red bits and they made it look really, really great and I just love it. Overall, this is just an incredible movie, incredible stuff, and I love it dearly. So you know what? It's a 9 out of 10. I love it, okay? It's really good. You got me. It's great. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. Unfortunately, this trilogy ended with a flaming pile of just the worst that I've ever seen, but I do love it dearly. Spider-Man 3. Oh, this one. Everyone knows this movie's bad. I don't want to talk about it for long. There's not really much else I need to say. It's Spider-Man 3. Everyone knows it. Everyone knows the finger gunning. Everyone knows Venom looks horrible. Everyone knows that it's weird. Everyone knows that angsty Parker is funny and hilarious. Everyone knows that Kirsten Dunst is once again terrible because in the last movie she said that she'll love Peter despite him being Spider-Man and then right into this movie she doesn't love him because he's Spider-Man and it's like, ugh, I have to deal with you being Spider-Man the whole time? There's not much to say. Harry getting amnesia and then not getting amnesia just seems really convenient for the plot which is never good in writing a movie or a story. I just hope that everyone understands that convenience shouldn't be the solution. <laughs> but honestly, this, this just isn't a good movie. It's weirdly consistent. The tone is campy and fun, just like the other two movies. But the other thing is I can feel a definite just like, okay, that's Spider-Man 2, that's really good. And it's Spider-Man 3, okay. It goes weirdly from really good to something that is consistent, but just not good. I will say though by far that this movie is the funniest. I doubt that's intentional because I never laughed at any of the jokes it actually makes. I just laugh at Tobey Maguire being evil and I laugh at all the things that were turned into memes. <laughs> I will say though, oddly, this movie has some of the best CGI of the whole series, just because I guess, why not, you know? The Venom symbiote looks really good. <laughs> like. It's weird. I also want to talk about that obviously this movie isn't as terrible as everyone makes it out to be. It's still funny, it's still consistent, and yeah, most of the terrible elements are because of the studio making things happen, like having Venom be in there, and I believe Sandman was an addition also from the studio. I think Sam Raimi just wanted Harry Osborn as the Green Goblin, which would have been really good. But I digress. Also, this is one of the least comic accurate uh, movies I think I've ever seen. I just want everyone to accept that because this movie has caused the perception of uh, Peter Parker wearing the symbiote suit to very drastically change. See, the symbiote suit in the comics never made Peter Parker angry or mean or, you know, finger gun people. It just made him tired. And that was because he was secretly controlling him at night to fight crime and be a bit rougher when he wasn't in control. But it never caused Peter Parker to 
do evil things, you know? It just made him tired, and then he got the Fantastic Four to get rid of it for him. Did this movie really recontextualize what the symbiote suit does? Now, do I prefer what this makes it do? Yeah, absolutely. I think that this is a way more interesting thing and a way more interesting plot device than just, oh, it makes him tired. I think this gives him a much more compelling reason to want to get rid of the suit. But of course, I can't talk about this movie and not bring up that it is incredibly inaccurate to the comics and also it really recontextualized everything. Now the symbiote often just comes from space attached to a spaceship, like in the spectacular Spider-Man TV series. That's not what happens in the comics. He goes to Battle World and he is like, ooh, look, bloop. I'm the black symbiote suit Spider-Man now. It... Sorry, I just, it's really different from the comics. And now people are saying that this is the great time for Tom Holland to get the symbiote suit because he'll be angry and brooding and like I scream no because that's not what it does in the comics ever since I started reading comics I've become much more of a nerd what else do you want me to say about this movie man everyone talks about this movie everyone knows everything about this movie pretty much six out of ten okay we've been recording for a while and we only just got through one trilogy let's go to a duology <laughs> okay let's be straight here these aren't good. <sighs> Ever since No Way Home came out, oh yeah, by the way, I think I should say spoiler warning for No Way Home, like, everyone's seen it, but you know. Ever since No Way Home came out, people have been somewhat lauding these two movies as incredible, and I don't get it. I don't get it. People have been saying, oh, S The Amazing Spider-Man is really underrated, and oh, Tasm 2 really isn't that bad, guys. So I feel it my civic duty to reel people back in and make them understand these movies aren't as incredible just because they got Andrew Garfield. Now we'll start off by saying, in both of these movies, Andrew Garfield is by far the best Spider-Man. There is no doubt in my mind that he is the most comic accurate Spider-Man. He cracks jokes, he's doing fun things, and he's beating up bad guys. Sure, he does do a few odd bits here and there. He doesn't save as many civilians as Spider-Man probably would in the comics. But just in personality, he's most certainly the most accurate Spider-Man. Tobey Maguire wasn't a really accurate Spider-Man. He barely made any jokes while fighting. And that's a big part of the character, is all the quips and the funny haha -ha things he does. But of course, you know, he was a good Peter Parker. And that's where Andrew Garfield fails. Andrew Garfield, and I'm gonna say this with as straight a face as I can, is too sexy for Peter Parker. Let me explain. Andrew Garfield is way too a skater kid, a punk. He's not really an outsider. In the first scene that he that someone's getting bullied in The Amazing Spider-Man 1, it isn't Peter. That's a grave sin of Spider-Man movies, okay? It should be Peter Parker getting bullied. But let us dive deeper into The Amazing Spider-Man 1 and explore what are the good and bad bits about this movie. Let me start off by saying I feel weird about this movie because I feel it's a more well-made movie than the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man, but I wouldn't say it's a better movie than the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man. It's weird. They're so evenly matched in that where this movie succeeds, uh, the first Spider-Man movie uh, doesn't. And where the first Spider-Man movie succeeds, this movie doesn't. And it's strange to me. The movie starts off with a bit of Peter and his parents, and I already don't like that. Peter Parker's parents shouldn't be important. That's a big part about his character, is that the spider bite could have happened to anyone. And the fact that both of these movies focus so deeply on Peter Parker's parents making the spiders is not a good thing. It makes it less, oh, it could have been anyone, and more, oh, it was super supposed to be Peter Parker. Of course, there's a few interesting things about this movie that I feel I need to bring up. First off, of course, I've already mentioned, first bullying scene, not Peter Parker. Peter Parker's a skater kid for some reason. I mean, it's cool and all, I guess, and I feel that it would fit into, like, the Ultimate Universe, sure, but I feel it only fit into the Ultimate Universe 
after Peter got bit by the spider. Because here's the thing. This comic really could have been a good adaptation of the Ultimate Universe's Spider-Man. Because here's the thing. Once Peter gets bit by the spider, he becomes like a basketball playing, like sporty kid who starts flunking out in school. And I could have easily seen him also become like a skater and be a bit more of an emo and a punk type character and be like ruder to his aunt and uncle. And instead, he was already that. So I feel that if they made the slight change of just, he starts out more like normal Peter Parker and then becomes Andrew Garfield Peter Parker, that would have been just a really good like adaptation of the Ultimate Universe comic, which missed opportunity, I want to say. There are a bunch of really fun things in this movie. I feel the big spider room is a little dumb, but it does look cool. It is just guarded by a weird, like one of those phone pass codes that you just go like that for, which interesting choice, Oscorp. It was Oscorp, right? I believe so. And there are a couple of cute scenes. I like when Peter first gets his ability and accidentally like destroys his whole bathroom. And then I like when uh, Flash Thompson and Peter are quarreling and then Flash is like, hey, I'm sorry that your uncle got like killed, bro. That, that was just kind of sweet. And I like to see that. Now I want to talk about something here because this is possibly my most controversial opinion. I really like the Spider-Man suit, you know? I really like it. I know a lot of people aren't a big fan of it. I know it's a big radical change, but I'm a fan. I think it looks good. I think it looks really different and new and it's kind of nice. Not gonna lie, it's just my opinion, but I kind of like it. I definitely think that this movie also was the start of Spider-Man turning from more of a beefy, bulkier type character to a more lanky and lean type character. If you look at Tobey Maguire, his uh, model for Spider-Man is a lot more bulkier, whereas this Andrew Garfield Spider-Man is a lot more lankier, which I feel I like the lanky Spider-Man a little more, so ooh. But of course, I need to talk about a couple of bad things because there are a couple of bad things in this movie. I don't like why Peter becomes Spider-Man. He doesn't become Spider-Man because with great power comes great responsibility. He becomes Spider-Man out of revenge. He wants to find Uncle Ben's killer and then, I guess, kill him? That's terrible! That's not Spider-Man! No, 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 no! That is such a radical deviation from the character that I don't even know where to begin. Spider-Man needs to become Spider-Man because Uncle Ben died and he could have stopped it if he tried. That should be why Spider-Man becomes Spider-Man. Not revenge. I feel dumb that I even have to say that, but I need to. I do feel the scene where he first has like the full Spider-Man suit on and he's in the backseat of the car with the carjacker and then like he webs the carjacker to the wall and things like that. I think that when the guy pulls out the knife and he's like, oh no, my weakness, knives. That's a good scene. That's a Spider-Man scene. I feel if I wanted to describe Spider-Man in like one scene, that would be the scene. However, everything right after that is a little terrible because like he webs him to the walls and then he's like, vicious. I watched a video by Elvis the Alien where he talked about both of these movies and I feel I agree with his point that if they had done that scene but then afterwards Peter's like up on a bridge or something and he pulls off his mask and he's like, what am I doing? This isn't what Uncle Ben wanted being too mean, bro. I feel that would have justified his actions more and could have set him up to become a more noble and more caring Spider-Man, you know? And oh, what else is in there in the movie? Ooh, the lizard. <laughs> I need to be honest. I'm very biased. I love lizards. I love reptiles. I love herpetology. <sighs> and the lizard is my favorite Spider-Man villain. I know he's kind of a dumb villain. I know his whole thing is just, grr, I'm a lizard in a sewer drain and I want to turn other people into lizards. But I love him so much. He's my favorite Spider-Man villain of all time. Yes, that includes Green Goblin, Doc Ock, Venom, everyone else, Carnage, everything. I love the lizard above them all. And I like the lizard in this movie. His whole plan is just, well, I'm a lizard now, guess everyone else has to be. 
And I like that. I feel that's a very lizard type plan, and I think it correlates well with just the character. I do want to talk about his design. I think they tried to make it a little too realistic humanoid lizard. I feel the flat face doesn't work well, and I think they should have added some type of muzzle or jaw. I think I talked about this in my ranking video too, because it's pretty much the one thing I don't like about this lizard. I also wish, because in the end scene, he does have a lab coat on, but then he just pretty much takes it off immediately. And I think if he had kept the lab coat on, it would have made the look really complete and really be like, wow, that's a cool look for the lizard. They even like get it shot up, so it would have been like the perfect edgy, cool look for the lizard. You know? It's a tattered, like, lab coat. What's cooler than that? I do like the first scene where he becomes the lizard and he wrecks the whole bridge. I think that works really well for Spider-Man in particular because that's when he kind of really becomes a hero. When he gives the kid his mask just so that he's not scared. That's a really cute scene. I really enjoy that. And I think that that's also a really nice scene in this movie. But overall, this movie doesn't have a lot to talk about. It is strangely bland. I don't know if that's the right word or not, but it feels it, you know? So I guess what I want to rank it is a 7 out of 10. It's not average. It's not just an average movie. It has really good bits, but not enough to push it over the edge to an 8 or a 9. And now this movie. And I want to preface this. When I rewatched The Amazing Spider-Man 2, I actually ended up liking it a lot more than I thought I would. However, this is by far the worst Spider-Man movie. There is no doubt, I think, in anyone's mind, or at least I wish in anyone's mind, that this is the worst Spider-Man movie. But I've been on Twitter a bit, and I've been looking around. And y'all have some dumb opinions, okay? I'm sorry. There is a weird amount of people saying that this, this, is their favorite Spider-Man movie. And you know what? I wasn't much different. Let me tell you, I wasn't much different, okay? When I was really young, I grew up with the Tobey Maguire movies, and I adored them all. I love Spider-Man 3 because I thought Venom was cool. I love Spider-Man 2 because Dr. Octopus. I like Spider-Man 1 because Green Goblin and Spider-Man are really cool, okay? But then, the Tasm series came out. I watched the first Tasm movie. I was like, yeah, that's really cool. But then I fell in love with this movie. For some reason, because I was a dumb kid. But let me tell you, dear viewer, this movie is horrible. And I would pray for anyone that actually thinks that this is the best Spider-Man movie, because believe it or not, there are a lot of people that think it. However, I feel it's not fair to just say that, and not also say the good bits, because there are good bits. First off, this is the best Spider-Man suit ever, period. There is no doubt, I think, ever, that this is the best Spider-Man suit. It's insanely comic accurate, and the model that they have for the CG looks incredible, and yeah, it's just the best Spider-Man suit. That is, that is just flat out a fact. It's the best. There's a montage sequence where Peter Parker's going around doing Spider-Man things, you know, the bit where he's sick and he sneezes and he has to save the convenience store, and he's Spider-Man, and then he helps the kid who's getting bullied and he's got a science fair project. That's a very Spider-Man type scene. Okay, moving on from the two things I like, this movie is terrible. Yeah, Spider-Man is making jokes, but in like the opening scene, he's making jokes with Alexi, aka the Rhino, and he's not saving a single person. You know how many people Spider-Man saves in this scene? Not many! He lets the truck crash into a bus full of people! For funsies! It's crashing through cars in the street. People are dying! That's not a Spider-Man thing to do. Spider-Man would be like, okay. And now driving the truck on my own. Thanks, we're gonna get this out of here. Why? Oh, why? Oh, why, oh, why, oh, why is this film loved? Because I thought I was crazy. I thought I was insane. I thought, oh, surely not. Surely, if this many people on Twitter love it, it must actually be a secret hidden gem that I've just expelled from my memory because I've heard so many differing opinions online. But no, it's exclusively after No Way Home that this becomes a really good movie. Why? Why? I feel I'm going insane here. There are legitimate a lot of people that think this is the best movie, and I don't know why. 
There are good bits in this movie. Gwen Stacy's death, I think, is handled really well. From the moment she dies to the end of the movie, that's a pretty good scene. However, I don't exactly like that people are just crowding around to watch Spider-Man fight the Rhino. That's kind of dumb. They're gonna get hurt, Spider-Man. But that's like a good bit. So why is the rest of the movie terrible? The film opens with a bit about Peter Parker's parents. That's horrible. There's a whole plot about Peter Parker's parents. That's terrible. There's the song in it that goes, For you, for you. Ba -ba -ba -ba, I don't want to get sued. Ba -ba 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 Which, I want to say, not a terrible song, but it is a pet peeve of mine to hear it in a bunch of movies. I don't know what it is. And then there's a like tro. What did they do? <laughs> Max Dillon is just Jamie Foxx being weird. And then he's got lightning powers. I don't get it. I don't get why people like this movie. I need help. <laughs> I looked deep onto Twitter. And I can't find anything. I can't find anything. I think people just like this movie because, oh, that's the one no one likes, so I'll be different for liking it. But I can't even tell if that's what's actually happened or not. I feel I'm going crazy talking about this movie. Two out of ten. <sighs> I've been talking about Spider-Man for a while. Let's move on to the MCU trilogy. I think I'm not making that crazy of a statement in saying that the MCU trilogy is the best. I think it has a nice blend of comedy and action and MCU stuff that makes it really good, you know? I don't think I'm shocking too many people in saying that. Let's start with Homecoming. I think Homecoming is really, really good. Initially, actually, in that ranking video, I said that it was slightly worse than Far From Home, but in actuality, I think I need to explain that my opinion flip-flops on those two movies. One day I'll think Homecoming's better, the next I'll think Far From Home is better. They're really evenly matched to me, and I really like them both. I think Liz Allen is a weird love interest to have. She's not exactly a well-known Peter Parker love interest. I'm sure, like, in the comics, yeah, she is. But, you know, like, Peter Parker's love interests are more often MJ or Mary Stacy. Or... Mary Stacy. <laughs> MJ or uh, Gwen Stacy or even Black Cat, like Felicia Hardy. I don't think Liz Allen is known as much to just the wide public. So it was a bit of an interesting choice to have her in a movie. And not just that, have her in one movie, just one. She was only in this movie. And then, this is just a good Spider-Man story, okay? It has a lot to say about the character. I like that we see the Vulture's origins, and we see Spider-Man a bit. And this is a Spider-Man origin movie, which I really enjoy. I like that we're seeing Spider-Man already Spider-Man. I don't exactly love that Spider-Man and Iron Man are really tied together in the MCU. I'm not a huge fan of it, but I'm also not complaining. I don't think it's horrible. I think it allows for some good plot points and a good couple of ideas to be shared through for the character. But you know, I do like that No Way Home kind of erased that. <laughs> I like the suit in this movie. I like how it looks, but at the same time there are things I don't like. I don't like the black bands around all the blue. I think that looks a little weird and out of place. I think that Tom Holland does a really good job as Spider-Man. He's generally really charismatic and really happy and energetic. And I think that works. He makes a couple of quips. He's definitely not the quip machine that like Andrew Garfield was. So I think he's a little more subdued and I think that works because he's more in the infancy of his Spider-Manning career, you know? I think he's a good mix of a good Peter Parker and a good Spider-Man. I like the story of this movie focusing on the Vulture. The Vulture, much like Dr. Octopus in uh, Spider-Man 2, is most certainly not the Vulture. He's incredibly different from his comic counterpart. However, I like this version of the Vulture a lot more than the comic counterpart. This guy is a lot more planning and cunning and vicious. Yeah, vicious is the right word. He works in a team. He's got big themes of family and tied together. And I think it works really well for the character that they were trying to portray. I like that Spider-Man's whole thing in this movie is learning to that you don't need the big tech to have to fight the bad guys. You need to be able to do it on your own, which I think works really, really well for Spider-Man. <laughs> I like the fact that 
he doesn't lose the suit halfway through the movie only to regain it pretty much immediately for the final fight. I like that he actually loses it and then doesn't have the fancy suit during the final fight. He has to use his homemade suit, which by the way, I definitely don't think that's Tom Holland Spider-Man's first homemade suit. I definitely think that's like a perfected homemade suit because it looks really, really good. I like that the whole final battle, even to the very end, when the Vulture is like nearly killed him and promised that he would, he doesn't try to kill the Vulture. He webs down the Vulture and tries to stop him from being blown up. And I really like that, bam, he wins. He stops the Vulture from pretty much killing himself. <laughs> I think that's a really Spider-Man thing to do. This movie is legitimately what I would recommend to anyone that has not seen any Spider-Man movies. This is probably, I think, the best intro to Spider-Man, and legitimately, I just love this movie. I think it's a really, really good movie. I'm gonna say this is a 9 out of 10. Yeah. Yeah, it's that good. But of course, then there is Far From Home. Now, I'm gonna be very, 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 very honest here. I love Mysterio so much. I love Mysterio. He is one of my favorite Spider-Man villains, and I think the MCU portrayal of Mysterio is potentially my favorite Spider-Man villain for the MCU specifically. I think he's the best one that was made for the MCU because I think we can all agree Green Goblin in No Way Home is the best Spider-Man villain. But I think that here for the MCU made villain specifically, he works so well, man. He is manipulative, he is cunning, he is smart, he is deadly, and I love it. He is straight up willing to murder a child so he can fool the whole world into thinking he's a superhero. That is incredible. <laughs> I like that this movie focuses more on Spider-Man out of his element. He's not back at home. He doesn't have the Iron Spider suit. Thank God I hate the Iron Spider suit in the MCU. It looks terrible. And instead, he's just in Europe and he's trying to have a nice summer vacation and this movie also focuses on the plot point of doing what you want versus doing what is responsible. And Spider-Man learns that when he gives up Edith and he goes to do what he wants, he realizes, oh no, people are gonna get hurt because now Mysterio knows. And he knows what's responsible to do is to call Happy, is to get into the jet, and is to stop Mysterio at all means necessary. And I think for a Spider-Man movie, that is amazing. That is just incredible, flat out. I think the red and black suit looks immaculate. That is a suit that looks so, so good. And they didn't mess it up. It is really comic accurate. Let me explain. In the 60s, they used blue to shadow black because you can't exactly make a darker black so they thought blue would do good. However, people thought that the black were shadows and the blue was the actual color, especially on Spider-Man. So whereas his suit was originally meant to be black and red, people thought it was blue and red. Ergo, Spider-Man is blue and red. So this is actually a really comic accurate suit. I like that. I also really like the texturing, especially on the arms, you see the threads going like this way and this way and this way and this way, and it looks really, really cool. I will say, the one thing about this movie I don't get is Mysterio's plan. Like, what? <laughs> His whole plan, right, is to fool the world into thinking he is a superhero. And then, become an Avenger? What happens when there's an actual threat? What? Does he just want to be a superhero and then peace out? Bro! What? I don't get it, you know? I straight up don't. Because that is a bad plan. He's gonna get found out the second he becomes an Avenger. I would really like to actually see a what if Mysterio won. That would actually be a pretty interesting story, I think. Overall, I think everyone knows Far From Home is amazing. This is one of the most polarizing Spider-Man movies for some reason. I don't get why. Some people just hate it with a burning passion. I don't get that, but I think it's amazing. Nine out of 10, I love it. And so 
we move on to No Way Home, which is by far the best MC Spider-Man movie. I think everyone knows that. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's about it. You've heard everyone talk about this movie already. This movie's new. You know everything you need to know about this movie. It's a great plot. It's a great everything. I really like it. <laughs> the one thing I feel is weird, it's a, it's a touch oddly paced, you know? It goes from no Spider-Man, no Spider-Man, no Spider-Man, no Spider-Man. He's trind to help the villains become good guys. And nope, oh, it's now plot stuff. It kind of like goes mellow right to 100. And that feels a little strange, but I don't mind it because I like that the first bit is just Spider-Man trying to deal with his identity being out, being revealed. I think that's a really good story and a really good idea for a Spider-Man story, especially. I don't like how short all the trial stuff is. I feel like that especially should have been a bit longer and a bit more focused on because it just kind of happens that it's like, Spider-Man, Peter Parker, you're under arrest. Okay, you're not under arrest anymore. That's it. Daredevil's a good lawyer. That, that's, that's pretty much the whole trial bit. And there isn't even a trial. It's a little weird. I don't know. I do like that it probably sets up Armor Wars because Damage Control takes a bunch of Stark tech, and so that's more than likely what Armor Wars is gonna be, you know? But okay, we need to talk about the most important parts, which is the villains. Oh my lord. They improved every single villain in this movie somehow. Except for one. Sandman is not great in this movie. You know? He's not. He's just Sandman. However, everyone else was improved. I like that Doc Ock is a good guy in this. It really, really works. And honestly, it makes me think of Superior Spider-Man and Superior Dr. Octopus once he gets all of Peter Parker's memories and is like, well, now I'm gonna protect Aunt May from Red Carnage, you know? Or not Red Carnage, Red Goblin. Ugh, stupid. <laughs> I really like that and it seems like a comic thing that Peter would do trying to save all these uh, villains. I really like Electro. I think out of everyone, Electro is the most improved villain and it's really easy, you just make him look not stupid, and you make his motivation, he wants power. It, simple as that. Bing, bing, boom. <laughs> However, of course, there's Green Goblin. I love the scene where he's like, That's some neat trick. That sense of yours. And then he just throws Peter through walls, throws him through floors. You know, he's hopping down, he's killing Aunt May, he's throwing bombs, and Willem Dafoe is awesome because he did all of his own stunts. He demanded that in his contract that he would only do the movie if he got to do stunts live action and proper. And that is amazing because they all look incredible. And I think they look a lot better than if it was CGI Willem Dafoe throwing CGI Tom Holland through the floor. I think Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin is the most effective villain in this whole list, especially the MCU version. He is probably the best villain. And I love him. The only thing I wish is that we got to see more of him. Because he is there, he convinces Peter to help cure them all, and then he's evil, he kills Aunt May, and then he's not back until the very, very end which I wish we had a few more scenes of him in there, but I am happy with what we got because it was really, really good. I also really like the ending. This is a whole adaptation of the One More Day storyline where it is Peter Parker making a deal with Mephisto so that he and MJ were never married so that he can save the life of Aunt May. That's the comic storyline. Here, it's Peter Parker telling Doctor Strange to make everyone forget about Peter Parker in order to save the whole world, and in turn, MJ's gonna forget about him. And honestly, I feel that's a really, really good way to adapt this often hated storyline into a good movie. I really like how the ending completely removes the MCU Spider-Man from Iron Man. He is alone. He is dirt poor and he is nothing. Hell yeah, he's broke and sad and no one knows about him. 
That's the best Spider-Man stories there are, where he suffers. I think I can't talk about this movie without talking about the obvious also. Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield return, and they are excellent. I think Andrew Garfield works way, way better in this movie than in either of his movies. I like that Tobey Maguire doesn't make many quips. It feels really accurate to his portrayal of Spider-Man. And I love the scene where they all land together. Overall, it's really great. I think I'm not surprising anyone when I rank this 9.5 out of 10 and say it is the best MCU Spider-Man movie and the best live-action Spider-Man movie. But it's not the best Spider-Man movie. There's one more. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is without a doubt the best Spider-Man movie and I could go on for hours. But I won't. You all know about this movie. You've all heard about this movie. Everyone knows about this movie. It is a 10 out of 10 without a doubt. I'm not gonna talk about it for long. I might make a huge video one day where I talk about it because I legitimately love this movie and I kind of want to talk about all of Lord and Miller's work. But this movie is so good. The animation is on point. Everyone looks fluid and dynamic and I like that every variant of Spider-Man is animated just a touch differently. Miles is animated on twos. That means that whereas everyone else is 24 frames a second, he is only 12 frames a second and it slowly grows up. But so at the end of the movie, he is running at 24 frames a second as a subtle way to nod that Miles is kind of blocky, but then he learns throughout the movie. Then I like that uh, Gwen and Peter uh, B. Parker specifically, are animated very similarly to Miles. You know, they're both kind of mentor figures, so they should both be familiar to Miles, and they're both trying to teach him how to do things. I like that they all fight differently. Peter B. is really comfortable with his webs. You know, he rings a doorbell just with the one swing. Uh, Gwen is really acrobatic and really good as the ghost spider. You know, that's her comic name now. And she's like swinging around and she does the... Well, except that's upside down, you know, and then she fights uh, Liv Octavius, you know, really like that version of Dr. Octopus. I like that Kingpin's the main villain. This is obviously really different from the main Spider-Verse story, but you know, I really like it overall. I could talk for so long about this movie. I like that Nick Cage is Spider-Man Noir, and I like that he's animated as if he were a moving uh, newspaper comic strip from the 1930s, and then I love Spider-Ham as Saturday morning cartoon literally floating through the air. Penny Parker's an anime brought to life, and I love it, and she looks so good, and spider SP slash slash DER is the name of the robot. Actually, no, I don't think there's an E. I think it's SP slash slash DR is the name of the robot. Spider. Um, technically, sp d uh, you know, because that's how bracket slashes work. They don't really make a sound, but it looks really, really good. And I actually think I like it more than the comic book look. I think it has a much more expressive look to it. And I like that it has its own personality. <sighs> I love this movie so much. If you hear anyone say that this isn't the best Spider-Man movie, they are flat out wrong. I know that everyone has an opinion of their own, but there are also wrong opinions. And the wrong opinion is saying that this isn't the best Spider-Man movie. This is one of the best animated movies, one of the best movies overall I have ever seen. And I love it dearly. It is potentially my favorite animated movie. I love it so much. I love its story about family, about learning to be yourself, about learning what makes you comfortable and what your purpose is in the world. It's kind of the story of all of Lord and Miller's movies, but also it's kind of really good here. The family stuff is more talked about in Mitchell's, the purpose stuff is more talked about in Cloudy with the Chains of Meatballs, and the Lego movie, I guess. But here it delves really into how do I know I'm ready for the world? How do I know that I'm gonna make the right choice? And frankly, the movie just says you don't. The movie outright tells you, you will never know if you're ready. You will never know if that's the right choice. Because that's all it is, Miles. A leap of faith. I love that scene so much. That is the best scene I think in any movie I've ever seen, is the leap of faith scene. He jumps down, he's going, Whoa, and it looks like he won't make it, but then the music soars and he's like, can't stop me now. I love this movie, and I think it's really obvious I love this movie. I think it's really surprising no one by saying I think it's 10 out of 10. Ah. Calm. But, that being said, let's rank these movies once more. And let's do it properly. Having seen all of them now, I think I can properly say which movies belong where. 
In ninth place, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, shocking no one. In eighth place, it's Spider-Man 3, shocking, I think, no one. Also, in seventh place, it's The Amazing Spider-Man 1, a little change for my rankings. In sixth place, it's Spider-Man 1 from 2002. In fifth place, it is Spider-Man 2. I was really hard pressed to figure out these next couple of ones. And Spider-Man 2, I put it just a bit lower, but I just want to make it clear that these next couple of ones are really interchangeable. Next up is Spider-Man Far From Home, then Spider-Man Homecoming, then clearly No Way Home, and finally Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Okay, I've talked a lot about Spider-Man today. And now I'm done. Happy spider man everyone. Yeah, I made February spider man because I wanted to talk about Spider-Man a bit, and I ended up making two purely Spider-Man-themed videos. What can I say? I'm a good planner. <laughs> I had a really fun time talking about Spider-Man and making a whole month dedicated to him. Maybe I'll do something like this in the future, but with a different character. I have a lot to say about Moon Knight. Maybe that'll be something I do later. I hope you all enjoyed watching. I hope you all have a nice day. How would you rank the Spider-Man movie, actually? I'm really curious. Would, could you tell me? I'd actually really like to know. I hope you have a wonderful day today, and I can't wait until next time. But until next time, see ya.